So everybody wants to be an archaeologist when they grow up, but where do you start? Here to tell us all about it is Joe Flatman, archaeologist and author of Becoming an Archaeologist, A Guide to Professional Pathways. Joe, do you want to start off by introducing yourself and how you actually got into archaeology? Sure. Look, thanks, uh, Ginny. Thanks, everyone at Dig Ventures. And thanks, everyone who's joined today. I really appreciate it because wherever you are in the world, you've got lots of other things you could be doing than, than chattering to me. And so do let's ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to ask any question about archaeology because so I did I did the book and I'm um, um, it's gone blurry on my screen for some reason, probably because my screen doesn't want to show a picture of the thing. Anyway, so I did the book and I originally did the book um, about 10 years ago. And at that time, I was working as an archaeologist, partly in the you know, in a university and partly for local government um, here in the UK. And then 10 years later, well, just over 10 years later, um, I contacted the publisher and said, look, actually, I, I think it could be I think it could be updated and told just give better stories and better narratives about how people got involved in archaeology and so they agreed and so so the second edition had come out and honestly my secret dream is that I get to update it every kind of 10 years or so and eventually I'd have this kind of this record over like a lifetime of where archaeology was and then how it grew but but that's another story but I, I got involved with that um and, and really started writing and started getting involved in archaeology like a lot of people, I found my way into archaeology by accident. And I think that's one of the really important things is because it it's fun and it's inclusive and it uses that brain and it uses that physicality. There's lots going on. It's not like I came from an archaeological family. I grew up in a council estate um, on the east side of Oxford. You know, not not poor, but not rich. I'm not posh. I'm I'm really, really like middle, middle, you know, um, and I went to a comprehensive school and archaeologists was one of those things that existed uh, at all and then I found my way to university the University of Southampton and honestly I went to university because uh, I was a kid who was clever enough to get to university and I didn't really want to do uh, I'm not, I, I feel like I should be careful now because I don't want to sound rude to others so I didn't want to do a more conventional subject I didn't want to do just history or or become a lawyer and I didn't have this urge so I, I studied archaeology and like everyone, I went, this is amazing. And then I got to travel and I got to go places. And I was at Southampton, uh, where you do lots of maritime archaeology. And so suddenly I'm on boats and diving places and traveling and seeing shipwrecks and hanging out with some of the crew who originally excavated the Mary Rose. And how can you not be inspired by people? Oh, yeah, I was the person who was on the Mary Rose as the Mary Rose being lifted in front of like 30 million people on TV, stuff like that. And, and, and so I found my way. And I, I think I saw a number of people there saying they're still hoping to be an archaeologist developer. I feel the same. I, I'm not sure I'm an archaeologist anymore. If, if I was to go on a dig ventures dig, I'm not sure I would be or should be allowed to pick up a trowel without somebody keeping an army. I know about archaeology, but I am not a good practical archaeologist i probably break things and damage things and i'd have to refresh my memory on how to dig how to survey how to draw a record and stuff like that and i'm sure certain that there's incredibly skilled people of a whole load of ages out there who know full or know an awful lot more about archaeology than i do in terms of like actually doing it someone says archaeology is so much more digging dead right yeah but you know what i mean it's kind of um we're all always on a lifelong journey and and so this book tries to reflect that and 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 it is something we'll come back to that i've tried to reflect the diversity of roles the diversity of places uh the rest of peoples and if there's one thing i'd love to do is i the, the book it tells a better story than the first edition it doesn't tell a comprehensive story and it might be something we'll pick up on that, that if any of you have read the second edition we'll go oh, i really wish you had spoken to my friend who does archaeology in this country or there's this amazing project oh it's been so amazing to talk about that because it's so many people uh you, you can't always and i was like oh, i just i knew i knew you know when you're doing a piece of work and you know that there's even better stories out there from someone who's doing way cooler stuff than you but you have to know who you have to know. Mm. 
Absolutely, yeah. So I suppose in a way, it, your own journey has kind of inspired this book and everything yeah. that has come from it and will come from it. it. Sounds like, you know, it's an ongoing journey for you. It doesn't stop yeah. here. Um, but what is that process like? How do you start sort of researching this this topic? I, I mean, I was lucky in that at that time I was partly in a university and you know when you're working in a university you are encouraged to sit and actually think and you're encouraged to teach and reach out to people and I was at UCL which is a very international any of you know UCL's Institute of Archaeology is right central London it has uh, a history of sorry I'm suddenly where it's finally sunny where I live and <laughs> the sunlight beaming in on me and just at the moment you need to better see me you can't see me so I'm just going to move my screen I do apologize so I was based at UCL and the sun is still in the way I'll see it back um I was working at a big university and I was meeting people from all over the world because UCL is a melting pot because it's in central London and its culture is here's someone. So every day you'd walk down the corridor and someone say, oh, meet so-and-so. They're working in South Korea. Work, meet so-and-so. They're working in Ethiopia. And you, you, you'd be. And then at the same time, I was working local government. And um, one of the chapters of the book is about local government um, in the UK in particular, but in other countries. And then I was, so I was doing really, really, um, I don't want to say practical, practical sounds unfair. I was doing really conventional management of there's a new housing development. There's a sewage pipeline going right through the middle of the site. Uh, some people have been digging up their basement and they've suddenly found um, a, um, a Roman kiln, which is literally one of the things that happened when, uh, when I was working um, as local authority, the archaeologist. And so I thought, I, I need to write the book about this. So I just start putting two and two together. I, and, you know, I found my old notes for it and it's just like, how am I going to do it? And I thought about the structure too. And um, those of you who have seen the book, I structure it and I do do it deliberately by kind of um, from certainly at that time. And I think probably still now broadly that kind of development led what might be called cultural resource management, or cultural heritage management. That is where the biggest money is. We have to be honest. And, and you do kind of have to chase the money. It may not be the best paid. It may not be the best most stable role but in terms of the flow of money which kind of keeps the keeps the engine of archaeology running we all know um that that kind of uh uh, uh i suppose polluter pays archaeology for the better term uh makes the most and so it started with a chap big chapter about that and then it goes to academic and then in that inevitably it's drawing on my own context. So there's there's probably more maritime archaeology in there than by rights there perhaps ought to be, because I know quite a lot of maritime archaeologists, because even though I don't still practice as a maritime archaeologist, uh I I'm a lot of my old friends are maritime archaeologists and things like that. But it, it evolves. So you you start writing. I know it sounds ridiculous, you start writing, and I think the biggest thing is bear in mind that when you read anything like this, for any of you who struggle with your own writing and archaeology and own writing anything um i'm a dreadful writer i hate writing i find it really really hard and the first drafts are so achingly painful it's like watching it's like watching the teenage you this kind of awkward geeky kind of they don't know whether and the reason i finally managed to write stuff is i just edit and i edit and i edit and i edit and so th this book is like probably 200 times of which I've edited it out and there's still stuff where I go I can't believe I put that in <laughs> I just, what, what a ridiculous piece of work um, and so think of that in the same way that if you're ever struggling with your own essays uh, my suggestion is write stuff down and then just edit like crazy time time again Absolutely, that's the way to do it, yeah. And while you were sort of going through this process of editing, re-editing, researching, putting this all together, is there anything in particular that sort of surprised you in this process? Anything you've learned along the way or? It's, uh, there's there's a couple of things. I mean, one is that stunning diver, and it's kind of connected, but but not quite connected to all, I'll, I'll explain. One is that stunning diversity. And over the 10 years ago, Archaeology was a very rich ecosystem, we might call it that. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things. Ten years later, I love the fact that it has got so much more um, uh, diverse in, in every possible way. You know, diverse in what people are doing, diverse in the nature of the communities doing it. Having said that, a couple of things. Um, one, are we as diverse as we could be? Do we properly represent 
British society, or indeed for any of you who are living internationally, broadly any societies you live in, in terms of the demographic makeup, we're on a journey there, like a lot of places. It's still, um, it's still quite often is a bit elitist. Is you know, I'm not a white dude talking about archaeology. Uh, old white dudes have been talking about archaeology for as long as they've been doing archaeology. It's inherently, it wasn't perhaps very difficult for me to to break into the subject. I fit the mold, and, and that's something we need to work on. Equally, though, I was aware that as I was researching it, again, it comes back to knowing who you know. I, I know there is amazing archaeology going on in lots of countries. Trying to track who is doing what in every country, even just some countries, is so different. And I would love, you know, my dream is one day I wake up and I get an email from someone saying, I'm writing a version of your book, and I'm particularly looking at, say, um, the archaeological communities of um, South America, Central America, or I'm, uh, you know, I come from um, a country in Africa and I'm talking about archaeologists purely working in my country or my neighbouring communities within, say, um, an area uh, of Africa or, or anywhere. And I would, I would love, I would love to read a book written from that first person perspective of practice, the practice of archaeology. Um, elsewhere in the world and hardly any books I mean one of the reasons I wrote this book is I pitched it to the publishers and they said oh someone must have written that book and I went no they haven't and I went no they haven't and actually hardly anyone has ever bothered the World Archaeological Congress if any of you ever heard of it they occasionally do a bit of this kind of thing but even they we don't really know who's doing archaeology everywhere we don't so it's how interesting would it be to be able to know about not just the big famous digs but just a community like a dig ventures community who is doing amazing practitioner led archaeology in all of those different countries. And we know, you know, you know, it's out there, you know, all of us can tell, kind of got that tingle in your fingers. You know that there must be people doing stuff out there, even if it's like two people here who care about their past and their place. But, but, but finding those people is the hard part. Fingers crossed one day you'll get that mm. message. Eh? <laughs> Um, and a final question before we move on to sort of the, the how to become an archaeologist aspect. Uh, where can people buy a copy? Um, honestly, I wish I could give you a secret code for a discount or a special link somewhere um, because it, it comes from a big published Cambridge University Press. Uh, the best thing is to, to Google it and see which is the cheapest place online. Quite often it might be a very large international online retailer whose name we shall not mention, but you know who I'm talking about. You might find it more cheaply. The other thing is, I mean, the only thing I would say, and this isn't me trying to upsell copies, the second edition is distinctively different from the first edition. The first edition had a smaller number of interviewees and it is 10 years old. So it's not a bad book, but it, you know, 10 years ago, it was 10 years ago, about, sorry, more than 10 years ago. So the second edition is going to right now be more expensive until it gets remade and cheaper. But for now it's like more expensive. But it is it is genuinely a a better book. Um, I reached out as part of the research there to find um, in depth people people to research to, to interview in depth as broadly as I could across the world. So there's about twenty interviewees, and I deliberately went for different people in different countries, different jobs, different age ranges. So there's people right at the start of the career, right at the end, and I've got. At least one or two people from kind of every major land mass. Um, there are a few gaps. Um, and this was before bigger geopolitical situations evolved when I was writing it. I could not find anyone from the Russian Federation. I know there's archaeologists working in the Russian Federation. I couldn't find any. People might have their views upon whether or not that would or wouldn't have been appropriate. But but you know, archaeology is archaeology. Sorry, once again, the sun is chasing me around my room. Um, archaeology is archaeology, and I, I didn't quite fill out all the gaps I would have loved to have done. Um, so, yeah, look for it online and see where you might find the second edition. Fantastic. Yeah. So for all those people in the chat who are saying they'd like to read the book, that's where to look. Get onto Google and see what you can find. Um, I definitely recommend grabbing a copy of Joe's book if you're interested in getting involved in archaeology professionally or otherwise. Um, but as we've sort of touched on tonight, as I'm sure you guys uh, can understand now, Joe has some incredible knowledge of different pathways into archaeology. So we're going to discuss some of those. 
Um, like I said, we're going to start sort of at the beginning of your journey. So you're on your first steps, whether you've just finished school or whether you're later in life and you've decided you want to get into archaeology. Um, how might someone start their archaeology journey? If we split this up, should we start with um, someone who's just finished school, who might be doing their A-levels or in the process of doing their GCSEs? What advice can we give them on the start of this pathway? I think the, the, the foundation for almost everyone is some form of voluntary participation. And it is, it's interesting that um, any of you who are a bit involved in archaeology are aware it's actually it's hot, in some ways it's harder and some ways it's less hard. The democratization of access to information in the internet. You know, when I was um, uh, 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 kind of 18, um, back quite a long time ago now in the 1990s, you know, uh, internet, internet barely existed. I can't believe I'm saying it, it makes you sound like I'm 400 years old. But um, the, the internet, you know, it was hard to research. I'd say you had to build local connections. Um, nowadays, obviously, first of all, you can actually find out what's going on. There are organizations such as Dig Ventures, which it is important to emphasize, you know, offers a unique way in both online and face-to-face -face into heritage. And when I wrote the first edition, Dig Ventures wasn't mentioned, not because I didn't care about Dig Ventures. Dig Ventures didn't exist when I wrote the first edition in like 2009, 2010. It doesn't, and it is in the book. Um, there are lots around the world of local archeological organizations, voluntary groups, community groups. All access is not equal. I am not saying that there will definitely be something close to you, but if you Google archaeology, other search engines are available. If you search online for archaeological opportunities and that just starting to volunteer and be interested. Similarly, there are um, quite a lot of magazines. I write um, a monthly column for an archaeology magazine called Current Archaeology, um, which is based in the UK, but broadly UK. They also have um, a publication from the same publisher called Current World Archaeology, there are other archaeological, and I say popular magazines, and I mean that in a good way. They are designed to be there for anyone who cares about archaeology, and they write in an open, inclusive, non, you know, a non operating um, way. They're, they're, they're fun, is the, the best way of putting it. Start doing archaeology, because let's face it, if you're interested in archaeology, and, and there's someone again, there's someone saying it's not sticking, so I mean, start doing archaeology in every possible way. Maybe that is volunteering a local museum, maybe it's going to a lecture, maybe it is going on a field work, maybe it is um, that there's a local community group who said that there was a site dug a few years ago, and they need time with someone sitting, working through all of the site archives, the paper archives, or the, or the physical archive, or the pottery, or the stone, or the whatever. And, and, you know, and then you'll meet people. And uh, I'm sure any one of you, you who are born archaeology would say you're finding this. It's, it's who you know in the best possible way, because archaeologists are really like-minded and very few archaeologists um, don't want to help other people on their own journey. Why am I doing this talk today? Well, I wrote the book, but I do it because I know one of the founders of Dig Ventures, who I think is online, Lisa, because Lisa and I, I can't remember the first time I met Lisa, because she and I met at some event and we got talking and we it turned out that we we shared a common view, which archaeology ought to be fun, it ought to be accessible, it ought to be engaging, we ought to make that open and care for people. There are a few people out there who are horrible and don't want archaeology that way, but we can forget about them, they, they, they don't exist. We're going to make our world the way we want our world to Um. And the other thing is, I, I, I would say, you know, if you see or you hear about a project, contact the people involved in that project. Hardly any archaeologist, if someone emails them saying, what you're doing is awesome, can you tell me more, how can we evolve, is going to go, nah, actually, I can't be bothered. And if they do, again, you know what, probably if they don't respond, if they're, if they're, or if they're rude, probably those aren't the people you want to be involved in. Um, and I think that doesn't matter if you're... Um, uh, of any age at all. And I notice a number of people here are coming from a whole stage of different life, life points. I mean, the only qualifier I would obviously put is um, if you are below the age of 18, uh, work with your parent, work with your guardian, look after your, but, but, but again, that's just common, uh, common sense and unfair term, isn't it? J judge your safety barriers in all cases for all, all of you at all times. We all need to be aware of how we engage with others because the world out there is complicated. So, Beyond that, reach out. Absolutely, yeah. And 
your uh, your point about volunteering things is absolutely correct. I mean, I when I started out in my archaeological journey, one of the first things I did was uh, volunteer for the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Just on a Wednesday afternoon, I got permission from my sixth form to go off and do half a day of archaeology a week. And it really does give you a great foundation if you're looking on to moving into archaeology um, as you progress through your educational career. Um, but you've touched on it a little bit. Um, you said sort of it is quite similar, uh, regardless of what uh, age you are. But is there anything sort of different you might offer for someone who's starting their archaeological journey later in life? Perhaps they want to move careers, perhaps they've retired. Is there anything you'd suggest? I, I think for later in life, do bear in mind what skills you have you know the worth of you and i'm not saying that younger people don't have skills they do but you may well have had a professional career in a whole load of ways and and let's face it archaeology is about humans and therefore the skills you have now as a human will be relevant to the skills of archaeology i wish for example that i had a decent background um in financial management anyone who's got any any either informal or formal qualifications in financial management an archaeological group will go like, come join us and and yeah you'll you'll be immediately involved now you might not actually want to be involved in the financial management project because you might go that's what i do as my day job i get paid for doing that however having that anyone with any level of computing skills beyond my level which is you know two finger tapping on word and excel who can create and data sets and manipulate data sets or use um, any form of geographic information system or any form of um, uh, kind of uh, Adobe or CAD or any drawing system like that. Those kinds of skills, you know, those are multiple skills. We don't call them multiple skills. You could be working in your, your day job designing, um, um, you know, all sorts of clever bits of engineering technology all of those skills completely completely um apply so i doubt i don't think i've ever met anyone who has a professional skill that they can't apply in some way to archaeology having said that someone on now is going to say i've got this thing and i'm going to go i have no idea what to do with that <laughs> but um, i i i hope not and i think that's the fun of it but but it is to go back to that point you know there are I don't know anything about a whole load of stuff that uh, loads of younger people uh, would know about. I could not possibly, for the life of me, go away and do really good, um, uh, say, videography and use a phone to cut and do, say, a TikTok video or some other form of social media video, because I'm just, I've just not got those skills. But I know for, a, for sure there'll be um, a 14 year old out there who's like, what are you talking about, you idiot? <laughs> That's the easiest thing on the, I, I'm doing that all the time and I'm getting it. My daughter asked me, she said, dad, you know, are you good on social media? And I said, well, I, I've got, I've got like a few thousand followers. And she said, well, that's a lot. And I said, yeah, but look at what, look at what audience participation on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, 4,000, 4,000 is nothing. For, you know, it's just, it's just the tiniest number possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's definitely a range of skills that can be brought into archaeology. It's such sort of a broad subject. And I think we'll touch on that a bit later when we start to expand on what kind of careers that you can have um, as an archaeologist. But um, I think one thing, uh, quite a few people in the chat did mention uh, that they were students, that they were studying, uh, be it archaeology or history or otherwise. Um, I think one really important question, one that I definitely hear a lot, is academia the only route into archaeology? Do you need a degree to become an archaeologist? It's this is a I'd really like to hear other people's thoughts and 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 the people at Digventure may have views on this. There has become a very established, possibly the most established route, which is that you have to go and have a degree in archaeology. And I have real problems like that. And I say that as someone who has several degrees in archaeology. When I was uh, starting to get involved in archaeology. It was just without question, if you want to proceed, you needed to get at least a BA and probably an MA and, and PhD was more a question. And, and honestly, I don't think anyone, I'm very dubious PhDs and that isn't me dismissing PhDs, I have a PhD. I, if there's something I would redo again, 
I would do my ma BA, my, my bachelor's, I'd do my master's, and then I wouldn't do a PhD. I would go off and do, do archaeology because I, 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 I look back and I go, were those four years most used to use? But that's another story. I would like to say that uh, it is possible to have a rich career without a degree. There are some people out there who have had careers in the past and in the present who don't have them. Having said that, they are a very small number, and that is not me denigrating them. That is just an observation. I would also like to think that archaeology is now properly evolving, and that as part of more inclusive recruitment, good organisations are, are saying um, a degree or, um, or, or relevant your rel commensurate relevant experience or you know the same kind of experience because I don't necessarily think you do need to have a degree and I can hear all of my academic former colleagues and a load of other people throwing rocks at my head at this point but you know um and well that's their choice uh there ought to be a range of ways in however I think right now you would probably struggle to get involved and get a job in the same way without a, a, a BA. I, I will be, a, but, but if someone disagrees, don't be afraid to disagree because I may not just, I may just, I may not not be close enough to the jobs market right now. People may say, you know what, actually, I don't. I'm having no problems getting jobs, and I would love to hear that because I, I think we should be more inclusive. And and having a degree and organisations saying they want a degree, that that's a barrier, isn't it? And we ought not have barriers to involvement. Absolutely, yeah. And sort of touching on those ideas of archaeology sort of being inclusive and growing in that inclusivity. Um, are there opportunities out there for people with disabilities or additional needs to also uh, become archaeologists? And, and I do think that's certainly something where when I wrote the first edition of this, it was it was subliminally mentioned when I mentioned and I put in a new section of credit. There is the Enabled Archaeology Foundation, for those who've never heard of it, looked them up. They have done amazing work, that, that, and there are there is a growing recognition, um, both that archaeology is and can be accessible to people from a incredibly a broad array of backgrounds and have an incredibly broad range of. Um, I'm not going to call yeah you know, the, the the modern term is um, you know you you put disability or different types of abilities. There are loads of people who. Um, might have to have slightly different ways of accessing so a load of people who might engage with data in different ways it's very interesting it's one of those things there's never been many surveys but I have a um, suspicion like a lot of archaeologists who I know that if you were to survey a um, good cross-section archaeology you would find a very very large number of us who have a whole load of different um, um, I'm going to call them um, kind of beneficial ways of observing the world. You might have dyspraxia, you might have dyslexia, um, you might have a whole load of stuff. I've, I've definitely got, I've never been formally assessed, but I've definitely got quite a lot of the markers, now I know them, um, for thinking about the world cognitively. And different. I actually think that probably makes me a better archaeologist. Um, I, I, I'm really rubbish at some things but I have very good 3D spatial awareness. And I'm sure that is something to do with how my brain works. So I have no problem going, oh, that thing, that thing fixed it together. And in a boring way, that means I'm really good at packing a car on holiday. Um, and in a more practical way, it means that when I'm on an archaeological site, my brain is building a 3D picture and other people will have that thing. So it is, and there have been hugely successful. I was in touch today um, with an older um, friend archaeologist who has had the most extraordinary international career and has been in a wheelchair there. Uh, they, they had um, a very bad accident when they were uh, uh, young and they have traveled the world as an archaeologist. It has not stopped them in the slightest. They wrote a very interesting book um, all about it. The, 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 the guy's name is Nick Fleming. Uh, and if you, uh, I think the book's called Apollonia on my mind. And he writes a chapter about how he was an archaeologist, um, 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 but, but wheelchair based and extraordinary. So yeah, don't be afraid. Fantastic. Yeah, very important topic that inclusivity in archaeology. We want it to be more inclusive. 
Um, so moving on slightly into sort of becoming uh, an archaeologist, these different professional pathways. So you've started your journey, you've gained some of that experience, be it academic or practical or otherwise, an apprenticeship, like some people are mentioning in the chat. Um, it's time to put that into practice. So let's sort of explore some of the pathways that are out there. As we've already touched upon, archaeology is a massively wide subject. There's so much variety. Uh, in brief, I, I imagine it's quite hard to do if you'd like to read Joe's book he goes into a lot more detail um, but in brief could you sort of summarize what kind of different careers there are out there in archaeology and what they mean absolutely um I am obviously I'm UK based and the book tries to be international it gives a fair it gives a range of examples but so I am speaking I'm not trying to um, speak for everyone and I acknowledge that some of you might go that doesn't reflect my lived experience so so let's start with that I mean obviously I start with the book the the main chapter is on cultural resource management cultural heritage management some of you I know is that is working um, for archaeological organizations who undertake um, a broad range of field work some of it kind of digging it some of it um, you know not digging some of it a whole load of different kind of research forms um, in advanced commercial development and that can be anything and in an awful lot of places, uh, the UK for one, the US, Australia, um, quite a lot of other countries, that is a, a big market. Now, um, right now, like everyone, with I know technically there isn't a global recession. There is basically a global recession. I know the UK has particularly challenging economic circumstances, quite high inflation, other countries don't. Broadly, we're in a bit of a slump globally. We all know it. We all know the broad deal is global. So that market is perhaps harder than it once was. However, there are still jobs. And I think uh, DigVentures is another example of an organisation where you are successfully, as an organisation, both undertaking, dare we say it, more conventional uh, commercial archaeology on that, and diversifying and I think the interesting question is finding your way into anyone who's interested uh, these more um, maybe it is the gig economy maybe it is it's that sense of engaging through that world but selling your skills in that way or, or being able to do it that is a big area uh, it is often quite precarious we have to be honest it, it, it is often um, quite low paid all archaeologists are quite low paid um, i'm strongly that all archaeologists ought to be much better paid across the board uh speaking as someone who you know uh, i i am very well paid for an archaeologist i'm not very well paid in comparison to nearly uh, an awful lot of other jobs out in the world so there is that community there is then the academic community um it's interesting. Um, apparently, there was a view coming out um, of my second edition saying that that my take on academic archaeology is really wrong and that I'm unnecessarily pessimistic. And I think it's because I used to be an academic archaeologist and I know some. And the view I get is that that is a particularly challenging environment to be in right now, um, which is a tragedy because for the people I know who are doing it, they're loving it. But it is, you know, you are having to do at that point, uh, BA, MA probably have a PhD you are working in that real high pressure and I'm not saying it isn't high pressure in the coach world but the expectation to research and teach and publish and win big grants and do big outreach things and 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 all the academic archaeologists I know are the most tired archaeologists and if I hang out with archaeologists uh, uh, it is interesting they're the ones who just like you look just so tired are you okay so there's that world. But on the other hand, it can be incredibly freeing because, you know, you're writing your own ticket. And, and I used to be an academic archaeologist and the buzz of teaching, you, you, you're seeing it um, I'm right now. You can see the energy I get from engaging this kind of. So, so there's that world, if you like that kind of setup. Um, I then have a chapter upon local authority, local government. And obviously this is where the variation in countries um, really start to show. Local in a British perspective means working in a local authority, working in local government. Uh, that is one setup. In the United States, it would be working in federal government. In Australia, it would be working in federal government. And for a lot of nations around the world, particularly those who have federal structures, actually that is probably, if you go to places like um, Germany, you know, a federal government structure that drives most of the archaeology. 
are uh, and therefore being embedded and understanding that community i still look back and i think my my most useful experience came from spending six years engaging with a local community and local developers in helping people understand and manage the archaeology of the community and some of the wisest people i know are the people who have become properly embedded in that sense of they just know their place and when they hear that there's a new housing going in on a particular area, i bet you anything we'll find like an iron age village or a bronze age thing and lo and behold like three days later oh yeah we found that thing and they just because they just got to know their space so there are there are really interesting opportunities but the opportunities are on bonus we have to be honest uh there are a few entry level i would love to see local authorities having more a an apprenticeship route through i mean we've seen several people coming commenting and i love there's so much potential in apprenticeship in archaeology wouldn't it be great to see a uh a much clearer really lots more and there are some opportunities for much clearer route for apprenticeship working your way to archaeology and local authority the another chapter is then upon kind of central um and higher level state organizations again very big international differentiations if you are an archaeologist working in china at the modern at present day you are likely to be working almost without question for some part of the state apparatus and that is not me i emphasize being dismissive it is reflecting that the the nature of um, the archaeological community in china is very largely part of the structure of government and you don't quite have the same um uh, diaspora or you know different sections that, that we have in other countries the, the, it's probably hardest of all to give examples of how there are opportunities to work in the very complicated uh central government roles of archaeology however most governments have in some format some form of archaeologists working for them and often the happiest archaeologists i know working there have found their little niche so they might be working on say road development and stuff and they might be working as part of a transport planning team or they might be working on climate adaptation strategies so you know if you if you live in a, a nation which is really taking that kind of thing like wind farm developments or things like that but it's very hard to necessarily draw um, direct, you know, lots of comparisons. So I had a job um, for a few years working for Historic England here in the UK, uh, where my archaeological skills um, uh, were pulled upon that. So, so there are these kind of opportunities, but it's it's probably the hardest one to fully kind of map out. But I, there's a whole chapter on that. Um, and if you're lucky, you know, I know an archaeologist who works for the federal government in the United States and literally travels the whole of the United States doing archaeology, um, you know, pretty well paid. So that's an interesting one. And then the final chapter, I now what have I called it? I so I check now. So I have a copy of the book next because I forget what that final chapter I've actually called it. So I called the final one public and community archaeology. And um some of you again may be just screaming like that's such a, a a broad brush. It was it's the final chapter which is all of the other stuff we haven't covered. Um, Dig Ventures is in that chapter. My organization, the National Trust, is in that chapter. Now, in the nice possible way, Dig Ventures and National Trust are very different organizations, but I, I put it in that sense that there are an awful lot, and I think the really interesting growth area for archaeology is that big community who do heritage, and let's not even call it archaeologists, fine, who do heritage. Uh, uh, in a participatory community focused manner. And I have found after many years of not always being as happy in my career as I might have been, that I am happiest in this setup where it is very much focused on working with volunteers and with other local community groups, where it is generally small team based and very inclusive in terms of very little hierarchy an awful lot of you know what we will bring together a team of talented people who are respectful and we don't worry too much about the harkers and i think it fits quite a lot of us again perhaps from um various different cognitive 
uh, perspectives. And I also think it probably appeals to a lot of people in the modern world who they want, they don't want to break is the wrong word. They don't want to be caught by established structures. They don't want big hierarchies. Um, they don't want to have a boss telling them what to do. I, I like that I am seeing um, more and more people following up this, this really hard to mind to make a way of doing it. And some of it, therefore, I think um, I am so interested to see where it's going to go. Where will, um, say, kind of really, um, I suppose, internet based and particularly kind of video based archaeology go? You know, traditionally, it was you had to go into the media, you had to do things kind of traditional mainstream media TV shows. And we know this place for TV shows, you know, people love watching archaeology TV. But equally, if you were to pull the data together, there's far more people watching TikTok videos, Instagram videos shorts and other ways on um all about archaeology then probably are actually watching tv because you can you know you've got a decent phone um and 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 whatever editing package you put on your phone you're doing social media archaeology in a way that could be dreamt of um so the fun bit is the opportunity the downside is uh how do you break into it and and how how do you actually make a career out of that there's there's relatively few within that there is obviously also a section on how universe and how museums are doing archaeology and and that's that's a really tricky area we know globally museums are having such a hard time the pandemic globally absolutely smashed into everyone but by golly museums um took a particular hit and i still um, I really worry about colleagues in that community and their opportunities to be, say, an archaeologist working in a museum are some of the slimmest of all. That is like my desperately trying to summate the book <laughs> chapters bit. That was a fantastic effort. So in essence, there is so much you can do in archaeology, whether you're doing commercial, community, academic, heritage, government or state, there is so much opportunity out there. And I think it's really up to you once you've sort of gained that experience to carve your own niche to see what appeals to you. And remember that it's fluid as well. Um, you don't have to stay static in one area of archaeology. You know, you can try them all out for size and see where it fits best for you. I think that's important to say. Um, and just very quickly, before we move on to sort of free archaeology or volunteering or crowdfunding experiences, um, do you know any good sort of resources, be that online or otherwise, for people to find these employment opportunities? Something which I imagine is quite difficult in the current yeah. climate. I mean, one thing is, yeah, you are, you're going to need to network. And let's be honest, the networking in, in every possible way. Again, bear in mind, you know, different um, locations, different ages. Obviously, I would ask you to reflect your own personal boundaries. Um, I personally find social media is still a good place. I know a lot of people hate things like Twitter. Twitter is actually, um, if you can manage to make the algorithm work for you a very friendly place and and, and you know anyone who finds you, you'll be able to find me i'm on twitter and on, on on instagram and i there is there's big politics of the all these things there's concerns about security data that's part of those networking with people and finding like-minded people and, and as long as you're protecting yourself from the craziness of that and the what can be can be pretty horrible places sometimes really good things there are also um uh online sort of community so in the uk many of you may be aware of something called bajr it's sometimes referred to as badger british archaeological jobs and resources that is one example it is primarily focused in the uk there are um i know there are examples of that in other countries the us in particular um uh, australia is another one I, I would say it is worth if you're serious um if not joining an archaeological organization at least getting yourself on their mailing list so yeah in the united kingdom and um, the council for british archaeology um in other countries there is generally one or two um either big overarching kind of umbrella organizations who care about archaeology in nearly any country that you care to think of it's it's not entirely the case or there are specialist communities because it may well be that you know like all of us what am i i'm interested in archaeology uh, but I also kind of have kind of historical background, maritime archaeology, and 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 I kind of um, there are certain things 
and certain themes like all of us and we're always still evolving now and if you're really interested in a particular corner of archaeology, you'll find your like-minded community and do that. And getting the magazines, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to sound like I'm shilling always for anything, but, you know, I write for current archaeology for fun. I don't, I don't write for current archaeology because it makes my living. I like being part of a community who shares these interesting stories. And they, current archaeology is one magazine, but there are other art magazines. You can subscribe to them. But again, they're online um, on, on, and most... There's like half a dozen really good, very accessible magazines in Archaeology these days, which you can you, you can find pretty easily. So I think reach out and and network. It is, I look back and I am, I I I don't think I'm sure any of you would say I'm not sure I could fully map all of my networks. And these networks, they wax and wane. Like Lisa, um, who one of the founders of Archaeology, she and I. It's not like we're best mates. It's not like we're talking all the time. Periodically, one of us will drop on another idea about a thing. And it's that knowing we've got that community of friendship and knowing different people. And periodically, people move in and out of one another's orbits in that way. And embrace that. Embrace that. Um, I suppose, embrace that ambiguity. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but of course, like we mentioned, uh, not everyone wants to be an archaeologist full time. So I'm sure there are people watching us now who are seeking opportunities to do archaeology for fun as well. Um, so hopefully those of you who are seeking careers have got some great information out of that. That's some fantastic knowledge that Joe shared. Um, but there are opportunities out there if you would just like to do archaeology sort of on the side as a bit of volunteering if you're sort of comfortable and secure in your career. Um, one of those opportunities is of course dig ventures. Um, we do have a variety of opportunities. Each year we do release our crowdfunded digs um, and of course we have some free opportunities as well. Um, these are primarily based in the UK, although the observant ones among you might notice that there is a, a sneaky one on our calendar that you can have a look at. Um, and I would recommend if you're interested joining our mailing list at digventures.com forward slash get involved. Um, we do, we welcome everyone regardless of experience. Um, we try to make it as accessible as possible um, and we'll teach you either how to dig or how to look after our finds. Um, and it's just, it's a great way to sort of start expanding that archaeological skill set. Um, but we're not the only ones out there that are offering opportunities like this. There are plenty of other places to find uh, these experiences as well. Um, do you know, Joe, is there any sort of resources out there or any activities that you can think of off the top of your head uh, that you'd recommend for people that people can get involved with? It's about the same. I mean, it is it's a tricky one these days. On the one hand, the Internet has meant there's loads of different information out there. On the other hand, there's pretty few aggregators out there pulling things together. Um, you know, current archaeology does do these kind of lists of voluntary digs. Um, I, honestly, I think the best thing for people to do is if you're interested in volunteering, just start searching online for your local community. Because let's face it, the biggest barrier to anything, it's like doing sports. It's like any anything that you want to do in a voluntary way. If it's close to home, you'll engage it. No one goes, well, very few people go and engage regularly in a voluntary activity, which requires them to travel a long distance because the logistics just gets in the way. So find where, you know, know where you're living and, and think about your range and then start looking. And you will probably find stuff because there's loads of community groups. That I, I love how archaeology at heart, I think is quite anarchic actually although it's quite conventional you know, people think of it as quite conventional when you find like-minded people who care about archaeology uh that that sense of we're just going to get it done and it's going to be three or four or five of us in a shed somewhere doing pot washing doing recording going to an archive volunteering a local museum that sense of you know what we're just going to do it uh, and, and some of the best projects, one of the joys, again, of my, my job is, you know, reaching out to people. And then when I do my current archaeology stuff and people drop me a line and say, oh, the, my community group is doing this thing. And you're like, ah, that is gold. And inevitably, because people care about that, they're having fun with it. You know, and, it, and the fun can literally be you're in this this rickety old shed with someone's home baked cake 
um, drinking mugs of tea, going through this pottery. But that can be revelatory archaeology. You, know, you don't need to be spending millions of pounds on stuff. In that sense, so it's democratised in that sense of it will be close to home. It will be free or incredibly cheap. You're making it happen. Absolutely, yeah. It's all sort of what suits you, what suits your budget, how far do you want to travel? Um, and there's plenty out there for everyone to get involved. Mm. And like you said, it's a great way to make those connections, to meet those like-minded people, um, and to really just have that that wonderful experience with archaeology. Um, so I think now we're sort of coming close up to seven o'clock, so I think it's time to open up to the audience for a Q&A. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to take a quick second to say uh, that this event is made possible by our Dig Ventures subscribers. Uh, if you are interested in becoming a subscriber, if you haven't already, um, you can sign up at digventures.com forward slash subscribe uh, for more online talks, courses and perks. And of course, everything that you do, this contribution that you're giving us makes all of this possible, helps us with that mission that I mentioned uh, of sharing archaeology with the world. And of course, uh, Maya has dropped a few links uh, in the chat as well. Um, you can head to our website and see what's on. You can join a dig. Um, as I mentioned, you can join our mailing list at digventures.com forward slash get dash involved. You can see what's on at digventures.com forward slash calendar. And you can have a go at some of our online courses at digventures.com forward slash courses. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to open up for some Q&A questions now. Uh, a couple have come in while we've been speaking. Do feel free if you have any, share them in the chat or in the oh, yeah. Q&A feature. And we'll run through some now with Joe. Um, so first up, I think we're going to start with Daniel. Uh, Daniel has asked, do you think that archaeology will help me with paleontology? Because I'm quite interested in both topics. I, don't know what you know. I think that's a yes. for sure. I think it's a yes. And it's really interesting one because I, I, I don't actually cover that in the book. And, and that I, I toyed with it and I long had, I oh, should I? And, I, and in the end I had paleontology. I don't know many, but I know a few. And they said, look, it's on the one hand, it's really similar. On the other hand, the technical issues are so challenging they said honestly our advices just don't get involved in there but yeah we all know that that um both in terms of the the time of the the lifestyle of field work if you are doing field work and some of the skills and background are there and in the public perception they are and let's face it all on a continuum you know if, if if you ask an awful lot of people they're like oh yeah you dig up dinosaurs like well no i don't but i know people who do yeah it's and and that understanding of time and deep time you know one of the thing top tips i would all give you is um i have a shockingly bad understanding of deep prehistory and i regret that bitterly because i didn't pay enough attention when i was a student um i was too interested in other bit of stuff if anyone wants one of my first top tips is really get to grips with deep time prehistory right through because that understanding incredibly useful for you um so it is it is interesting that i think there is probably a greater divide than ever in the communities and i think that's probably to do with the structures of it um don't i and i don't know i would love to be corrected if anyone knows i'm not aware of there being any universities which say do an archaeology and a paleontology degree or a link thing there's some will do courses in both and some but i'm not sure say you could do a joint honors in both but i may well be wrong that would be uh, definitely a good one to try out for daniel there but yeah no i hope that's helped you daniel with your decisions there um we have sort of two questions that have come in that are quite similar one is anonymous um one is from selma um both relate to sort of that journey in uh, deciding on an undergrad course our anonymous attendee has asked uh, what would you recommend looking at when deciding between undergrad courses uh, and selma has asked what advice would you give to someone looking to get into uni doing a degree what should one think of and where should one start to look yeah um i think that's that's very complicated uh, complicated one doesn't it it sort of depends on you really i think i think that is the one of the things i say in the book and i'd say it here listen to your heart i mean i remember I so vividly remember 
um, visiting different universities if you possibly possibly can and i know there's costs i know there's there's implications in this uh, and it can seem easy to or or just cost effective to to not visit i would say how if you can possibly go to the university because let's face it you, you you're gonna spend a substantial chunk of your time there you, wherever you do pick and i remember where i went off and i just when I arrived at Southampton um, for an open day and I was 17, I just felt at home and it just clicked. And it wasn't I didn't feel welcome at the other universities I visited, but Southampton. And I look back and I have I, I have regrets in my life. I have zero regrets about my choice of university um, because, yeah, it's what they're studying. But it's also so there's a whole lot of things here. Some if you are growing up in a. Um, say a very urban environment and the university which has a great archaeology course is actually in a very small um, town you may find that that disjunct between moving from your urban environment to a very rural environment very different or vice versa um, even that differentiation that you know some universities are right in the center of town others are campus universities um, you know are more on the edge of cities that kind of lifestyle thing it does matter I'd go and I'd, I'd, you know, go and ideally bombard the people. And um, there is there is a careers fair in archaeology. I think University Archaeology UK, UA UK, in the UK, for example, do an annual careers fair. Um, and that's worth looking up to you to sort of get to meet these people. But I think, honestly, trust your gut. If, you're, if your gut is kind of, eh, 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 just I just don't quite think it's right. And you can always move, you know, that's one of the other things. If it, I know plenty of people who went to university and they went either this course or this place was not right for me. Well, then if you get to that point, you can move and there's enough skills passports. I think um, we're going to mention the skills passports in a minute, quite possibly. Yeah, make sure that if you've got a skills passport, if you haven't got a skills passport, get a skills passport so that you can travel around because your skills are transferable in that way. So, yeah, um, I think I, I hope that answers that question. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I would agree. Yeah. I mean, I've recently sort of completed my own university journey myself. Um, I graduated in 2020 and I would definitely recommend going to see these places in person to get not just that sense of social, but also the sense of your department as well. Um, looking at modules is a really important one. If there's any areas of archaeology that you're specifically interested in, make sure that the unis you're looking at do actually service that interest and they do modules in that area because each university has a vast, uh, vastly different staff and vastly different research focuses. Um, so absolutely, yeah, I think going to see, making sure you have that feeling and like you said, knowing that if it's not right, you are more than entitled to find the place that is right for you, definitely. Um, very, very important. Um, next up, we have a question from Sophie. So this is another university related question. Sophie is doing a history degree with Open University. Uh, she asks, could she get into archaeology with a master's degree specifically in archaeology? Um, quite a lot of universities do. If you've got a first degree in yeah, a particular related subject like that, but even, even a slightly less related subject, most universities will allow you. Now, I'm not obviously I'm not a university um um, recruitment um, um, tutor. I think if you are interested, I would contact the university and explain your circumstances. If you can make a good case that you know clearly you, you are genuinely interested in archaeology, if you can talk to them about your kind of your aspirations, and awful lot of universities are going to be pretty relaxed about that. And you know, my first degree was in archaeology and history. I then ended up specialising in archaeology, but I've known people who often went in quite. Um, uh, qu quite quite wide ranging careers academically and still ended up in archaeology. So I I don't think that would be a problem at all. But can I check with the individuals? I think. Mm. Um, and next up, we have a question from Rose. Uh, Rose says, "Would you say that history or geography is more important at GCSE level? I'm unable to do both at my school." <laughs> First of all, Rose, I feel really sorry for you because that is really sad that your school doesn't Tough offer you the choice. opportunity for both because I was lucky I got to study both. Um, oh, this, I feel like I'm being asked to choose between 
two of my great loves because because that connection of geography particularly physical geography it kind of it relates back to that paleontology question doesn't it if you're interested in our landscapes then one of the best things about archaeology is that fact that you're sitting on a hillside somewhere and you're looking at what is big deep time geological change and what is um you change so that's me dodging trying to answer the question um but because i I'm going to say it depends upon the type of history. When I did history at school, um, um, my school was doing a very conventional curriculum. And the history I was doing was like 19th century British foreign and domestic policy. And, you know, uh, the, the, the corn laws and, uh, you know, uh, textile manufacturing in so-and-so, so-and-so. And none of this had any relevance whatsoever to the archaeology whereas the the, the the geography i was doing at that time was proper physical geography to do with like glaciers and stuff <laughs> and that unquestionably is more direct. on the other hand you might be in a school who is doing a really brilliant really um engaging history curriculum uh, to, to do with not quite obscure 19th century parliamentary legislation and, and it might be more useful. And I feel so bad because I feel like I'm dissing so many uh, my my teachers and my school and loads of things. And I just love both of those subjects. That's so hard. Mm. I do um, think I, both, uh, both would service you quite well. Yeah. I, I do think um, either or would be applicable to archaeology. Um, I, I also think that um, in terms of an application, GCSEs do matter. Showing people your passion for why you want to do archaeology will matter more. A, a, a university recruitment, you know, admissions tutor wants you to share their passion. If you share their passion and you're doing a whole load of science stuff without direct relation to archaeology, but you they can see the passion, that they won't care as much. Absolutely. Sorry. No, no, I agree. I think it's all the are all skills that can be applied to archaeology. Uh, I think it's very difficult. Uh, I don't think many schools offer archaeology GCSEs or A levels. Hardly, hardly any. Yeah, it's so, because the poor schools these days are so pushed. Mm, uh, it's a tiny number. It is, yeah. So I think definitely work with what you've got. Sort of follow your heart, follow that passion, and uh, I think either will will help you mm. get on that journey into archaeology. Um, Absolutely. So let's see what else have we got. We've got a few other questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, we are running a little bit over time. Thank you for everyone who's sort of staying with us. Um, we have a question from Anita. Anita has said, I'm interested in getting into archaeology conservation. Do you have any recommendations on that field? Um, the conservation side is one of those ones where, let's face it, um, uh, the an academic degree is probably more conventionally required and it isn't that you can't get some of those skills but uh all of the archaeological conservatives i know indeed all of the conservatives i know full stop because in the national trust i work with quite a lot of conservatives have extensive um uh professional training generally a master's um of some, quite often an msc rather than an ma uh, in this it, it is a uh, um, a small, highly specialised community. I know, for example, in the UK, there's the Institute for Conservation Icon, and they provide a lot of very good advice, particularly on this kind of area, because again, that kind of crossover of archaeological conservation and conservation more broadly, uh, you know, um, the conservation materials is often um, the community really um, 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 interact a lot. So the conservatives I work with in the National Trust, say working on um, paintings or historic contents, they will often know archaeologists and, and vice versa. Uh, that I'm not sure that's really answered the question though. Sorry, let me just reread the question again, just to make sure how I think about that. So the question was, yeah. anyone who's interested in getting into archaeology conservation, do you have any recommendations yeah. on that field? Uh, I imagine, yeah, you'd have to seek out some level of training for sure if you wanted to get into that sort of area of archaeology in the same way that if you wanted to sort of do uh, become a specialist, a fine specialist, you need that sort of extra backing, don't you? Yeah, 
Yeah, it's it's when it gets into these areas which often do have quite scientific experience um, and quite or, or perhaps scientific or quite technical elements that that you'll have to. I'm not saying there are no voluntary opportunities, but you'll generally have to follow that quite academic route. I'm more into it. And there are there are universities which specialise. Well, and let's be honest, if you're going to do that, you want to go to the places which have the labs, which have that ability to give you that amazing hands-on experience. And not everyone does have that. They really don't. Mm. Um, I see we're, we're sort of coming up to the end of our sort of window of time. There are two questions that I, I think we should definitely answer. I will say if we've missed your question, if you've asked one and we haven't had time to get around to it, uh, our inbox at Dig Ventures is always open. You can find our contact details online. I'm happy to pass on any questions to Joe as well. Um, so do uh, don't feel like we're ignoring you. Um, do feel free to get in touch. Um, but I will start with uh, LG. LG lives in London. They completed their degree in archaeology last year, which included fieldwork experience, and they also did a post excavation placement. Uh, they've sent letters and applied for higher grade positions, and they've seen many trainee schemes advertised around the country, but not in London. Mm. Do you think there's any reason for a lack of trainee schemes? In I, I suspect partly it is um, the the cost of doing business in London, let's face it, and it's something that, that we see in lots of different ways, because I, I live not too far from London, and I've conversations with colleagues. Um, I am surprised, anecdotally, that there aren't any opportunities. Um, it that given that there is the, the pace of development in London, given that there are um, you know some big archaeological contracting organisations and and universities and museums stuff like that in around London, I'm surprised there aren't any. Um, on the other hand, I suspect it is it is just to do with the cost and the pace of things right now. I am aware that, for example, though, that there's quite a lot of work that a um, museum of London archaeology do, and then there are there are groups, there are things like Thames Discovery Program, for example, who I used to involve with, who um, they do voluntary work in archaeology around the Thames area. It might be, and this is me thinking off the top of my head, that if you can find your way in through some of the voluntary community groups, but obviously that isn't. You know, you, you're looking to, to have a career and make money and that's harder. And if there are no traineeships, that's tricky. And then it probably is a bit of a question of would you be willing to travel out and be based in London and travel out? Or would you consider relocating? I mean, a lot of people do historically travel around as part of their career, certainly early on. Um, I, I was aware that I moved in and out of London and around a lot. Um, Careers, even my current job for National Trust, I, I chose to move because I wanted to pursue that career opportunity, and it was a lifestyle choice in that case. Mm. That's some great advice there. I hope we've uh, helped uh, you come to some sort of uh, decisions there, LG, um, and hopefully helped you understand a bit more about why there aren't trainee schemes. I really hope that you managed to find one. Best of luck to you. Mm. Um, our last question, because we we are coming up on time now. I'm going to pick Harry's question because I think this is one that I personally hear quite a lot. Uh, I think it's one that I hope would help quite a few people. Uh, Harry has said, as someone who's already been to the university and unfortunately chosen the wrong degree, i.e., not archaeology or history related, how likely do you think it is to get into paid archaeology after building up a strong base of voluntary work? It's a really interesting question. Yeah, I'd like to think that that, that is actually comes to quite archaeology, doesn't it? That if you've got that background and, and that passion, you can. I think it it's, I don't want to say it's random and say it's, it's so much chance, but there is the right archaeologists don't care necessarily about the route and having a degree partly almost it doesn't i'm not saying it doesn't doesn't matter what degree is but part of having a degree is showing your ability to undertake a period of study and have the discipline and have that structure and write essays and do reports and engage in that way and in that sense you can be studying almost anything and that's to say archaeology doesn't matter you know what i mean it's showing that transferability it's what i think we've been coming through all the way through this isn't it is there is stunning transferability um 
or, or, or from nearly any subject into and out of archaeology. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure it does, but you know what I mean? I would personally say uh, I do know archaeologists who have come into this career and are field archaeologists who don't have uh, a degree in archaeology, who have mm. degrees in other subjects. I think uh, we touched on networking earlier, and I think that's probably going to be the most helpful thing. It's making those connections in archaeology, gaining that experience, I think, is also a really great step. And we have also touched on the fact that archaeology is so broad that I think whatever degree you do, you have skills that you'll be able to bring to the table. And then by getting that training, you'll be able to sort of um, build upon that. Uh, and I think another great thing to do if you are based in the UK would be to invest in an archaeology skills passport mm -hmm. um, from Badger, I believe, are the ones who make those. Um, you can find them online if you Google archaeology skills passport. Um, even if you're not looking for a career in archaeology, it's a great way to track your development in all sorts of archaeological skills from the digging to site safety to public and community archaeology. And I think that would probably be a really helpful resource for anyone who uh, is looking to move into archaeology without having any sort of formalised training, particularly. Um, it's just a great way to collate that and to show it to potential employers, for sure. Absolutely agreed. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I think we've officially pushed the boundaries <laughs> of what time we have available now. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Joe, is there anything you would like to share or promote? What's next for you uh, before we go? Uh, yeah, next me is, I mean, obviously I work for the National Trust, so um, hopefully you yeah, um, do. If you're curious about the Archaeological Community National Trust, have a Google. There is National Trust Archaeology on social media. You can follow them. And we've got an apprenticeship scheme. And so there's a fantastic uh, apprentice archaeologist, Harry, who I work with in our region um, uh, in London, the southeast. And there's so many interesting things going on there. But otherwise, I just want to say thanks to everyone at Dig Ventures and thanks to everyone who's come along. Um, you know, I, I genuinely mean this. It's it's inspiring. I love meeting other people doing stuff. And Dig Ventures, you know, is is an innovative, really interesting, exciting organisation. It's good to be a part of this. I'm not just saying that because I'm uh, trying to you know uh, be, be nice. There aren't many individuals and organisations who are being bold and brave and exciting this way. I like doing stuff with Dig Ventures because they excite me and I get the same energy. Um, that, that, that I think a lot of people do. So thanks, Dig Ventures. It's been brilliant. Well, thank you for coming and joining us tonight uh, and for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, you've been really inspiring. And I hope that there are people who have been watching us live or who are joining us later uh, through the recording who have hopefully taken a lot away from this. And I'm hoping we'll see a lot of you in the archaeology sector in the near future. That would be fantastic. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us live. Uh, you've been an excellent audience uh, sharing so many answers, uh, so many questions even. Like Harriet has said in the chat, if uh, there's any questions that we missed and we didn't have time to answer, please feel free to get in touch with us uh, via email. We would love to chat to you and help you out as best we can. And I'd be happy, like I said, to pass on any questions mm. to Joe as well. People can but, find me on social media too. We're, yeah. yeah, it's an ongoing conversation, it really is. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, no, do have a look at Joe's social media as well. Um, and just one more reminder, don't forget that you can become a subscriber or join us on a dig. You can see all the links that you need at the bottom of the screen here. And of course, we're also very active on social media. It would mean a lot to me if you could follow us <laughs> and see some of the things that we post um, day to day, uh, particularly heading into that field season. We'll have so much exciting archaeology content out there for you. Um, I hope that you've all enjoyed tonight um, and I hope, like I said, that you've all come away with some knowledge, some extra knowledge to arm yourself as you take those first steps into your archaeological journey. Thank you again to Joe, and thank you to all of you. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday evening and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Good luck yeah, wherever you go.